And she starts screaming again that it got her again. And then she ended up with a claw mark on her stomach um, below her belly button as well. And we ended up getting out of there. I told her to leave. I started praying out loud. I was calling in every source that I could think of. Jesus, God, Mother Mary, Archangel Michael. I was calling on anybody that would listen. Well, obviously, you have the capability to assist souls to cross over. Again, we live in a, a realm of free will, so it is an individual mm -hmm. choice. Um, I guess that probably takes me on to your incredible experience of purchasing a haunted home. Uh, let's see. I was a single mother. I uh, had just I was recovering from a devastating divorce financially. I was rebuilding my credit. I was living in a mobile home with my my two um, children. I had a son at the time that was seven and a daughter. My daughter was thirteen. So and I've had a third child since then. So you'll you'll hear me uh, mention her too. But um, I had been looking for a year. For a home to move into with my children to kind of get out of that that kind of neighborhood and um my realtor calls me of course i had co contracted a realtor and the realtor calls me and she said to me she said there is a house that my colleague has just brought come back from taking pictures of and she says this house is in your price range and it is almost too good to be true and of course that should have resonated with me <laughs> so i immediately i race over i I, um, and, and this story gets really creepy. I don't know if you want me to tell it with the beautiful story that we've just had, but um, my realtor, I ended up meeting up with her. And of course they had the papers and things to, to look at. And I'm looking at this house and I'm like, there's no way that this house could cost this much. This house could easily have been sold for a hundred thousand dollars more than, than what they were asking. So I started to ask her, I said, you know, would you please call the listing agent and make sure that the price on this house is right? Because this, this house really is too good to be true. It's on a dead end street. You know, I started asking her, I'm starting to think, well, maybe it's near a dump or some kind of nuclear plant or some stinky paper mill for it to be that price. How could a house, I mean, it was, it was a, uh, it was a brick house. It was 2,400 square feet. It was a split level that you would come in these big double entry doors under the foyer and you would either go up the stairs or down the stairs. It had three bedroom, two bath, formal dining. It, it was a nice house. It had this area below too as well. And so when we got to the house, I'm looking around the neighborhood, you know, I'm looking to see what the, what's wrong with the neighborhood that the house would be that inexpensive. And there, there wasn't anything. And, you know, through this process um, with the house haunting thing, one thing that I learned is it's not always the old house with somebody who died in it or got murdered. A brand new house can be haunted if it is built in the wrong place. It's not about the house, it's about the ground that it's built on and what was there. And you just don't know what was there 500 years ago. You could be on somebody's burial ground. So with that being said, the house, um, um, after seeing that, when we, when we got there, she was having trouble with the locks and the lock is key because there were problems with the lock throughout the whole time that I owned it. It turned out that there were two demons and a young man that had hung himself in the house. So when we finally got the door open, I went into the foyer. She's struggling to get the key back out and I'm walking up the stairs and out of my peripheral vision, I see this young man hanging in the stairwell. And, um, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, of course, when I look directly at it, you know, I don't see anything. And I'm like, why would I even be thinking something like that? In addition to that, she had told me that the house was moving ready, which it was the people had already moved out. She claimed that they wanted to sell it quickly because they were having to go out of state and they've already purchased a place to live and they're paying two mortgages now. So she wanted for me to go ahead and, you know, she, it was, it was uh, move in ready. But this was the story that I was told, which turned out not to be true. So um, go in the house. I ignore what I'm seeing. A couple of other things happen. I ignore that too, because keep in mind, you know, I've been trained all of my life to rationalize and ignore these things that I've seen. So I tolerated much more than anybody else would have tolerated. Most people would have been out of there. 
So I asked her, I said, well, I want to make a bid on the house, but I'd like to bring my kids back and, you know, come back and, and have them see the house too. And so she agreed to meet me. We came back that afternoon. It just so happened that somebody else had been there and had actually made a bid on the house. So I had until midnight to make one. So of course the pressure was on and I wanted to go ahead and do the paperwork and, and make, make an offer on the house. My kids were running through the house, picking out their bedrooms, and they came up to, to the realtor and I and asked if they could go downstairs and see the, the lower level. And I said, of course. And five minutes later, they're back up. My daughter says to me, I don't want to move. I, I, mommy, I don't, there's, I don't like this house. I don't want to move here. And of course, I was embarrassed because here I'm standing next to the realtor who's been dragging me around for a year trying to find a house. And this house is like beyond our wildest dreams. I mean, I would be so proud as a single mother to be able to provide such a grand home, you know, for my children. And it was a beautiful suburban home. It just, it was very, very nice. And so I, you know, I, I said to her, I said, what did you say? Because I, I was taken back, you know, that she would even say that. And she said, there's something about this house that I don't like, and I really don't want to move here. Well, of course I ignored her. I went ahead and I bid, obviously I got the house. So um, at the closing, the people that I bought the house from were about two hours late. So I went ahead and I signed the paperwork and then they arrived. And the one thing that I noticed is throughout the whole time that we were sitting there, the woman would not look me in the eye. She stared at her feet the whole time. And I thought, you know, I'm doing one of these, trying to get into her, you know, her range of, of vision because I'm talking to her. I want to make eye contact. And she just stared at her feet. And I was telling her how I was going to go ahead and have the carpeting taken out and having wooden flooring put in. And she says, well, that's what we wanted to do. And they literally walked away from the table with a very, very small check. I mean, it was maybe around $1,000 when they left. So they didn't make any money really off of this house, you know, at all. And there were things that needed to be fixed and they did all of the repairs. They even changed a light bulb that I had requested. So, you know, there were things that I probably should have noticed, but I was so excited, you know, about getting this house. And I'd said a little prayer and I thought it was God's gift to me and my children for all that we had already been through. So the very first day we go over, I've got the keys, I take over some dinner preparations and my kids come and they bring an item to put in their room to kind of stake their ground. And um, I'm cooking and my 13 year old daughter comes to the doorway of the kitchen and she says, what did you want? I said, I, I didn't call you. And she said, yes, you did. She said, you called me. I said that I was coming and then you called me again. And I said, well, you know, I heard you say that you were coming, but I thought you were talking to your brother. I didn't call you. Yes, you did. You know, kind of went back and forth for a minute. And then my son comes in, he's peering underneath her arm. And he said, mommy, I heard you too. And so I'm like, okay, my children's names are their real names in the book. My daughter's name was Brittany. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, we're on a dead end street. It is dinner time. Brittany's a popular name. So this is a really, really creepy story. And I, and I, and I kind of want to leave people with a good taste in their mouth as far as the uh, colors of heaven. But this is how it all kind of came about where I was able to touch back in with seeing spirit. So um, anyway, at, at that point, so that very first day, this, the, the entities that were in that house were mimicking my voice. They knew who we were. They knew that my daughter was Brittany, that I was the mommy lady, um, you know, and that who everybody was. So they do have an intelligence about them, but they learned that very quickly just in that first day. So second day, I drop my kids off at school. I go back. I'm getting ready to do some of the work in the house myself. Um, I bought the house in March and I wasn't planning on moving in with my children until the summertime. So I could get renovations done and that way they could finish their school year out in the school that they were in. There was only eight more weeks of school. I didn't want to transfer papers and, you know, I wanted them to finish and then they could start from the very beginning, fresh the next year at the beginning of the year. So I was doing renovations. I was putting in, as I said, wooden flooring. I was pulling out the carpeting myself. And um, so the day that I went there after I dropped my children off from school, um, I mean, dropped my children off at school, 
I went into the house, I went upstairs, put my purse down, and I noticed that the oven light, the inside of the oven light was on and the one over it was on. And I started to walk through the house and every single light was turned on in that house. Now keep in mind, there's no furniture or anything in there yet. So it was all like the overhead lights. And I thought to myself, well, you know, this whole transaction happened so fast. With, they didn't even have a chance to put a for sale sign up in the yard. That's how fast it was. It went on the market. It sold the same day. So I was thinking, well, maybe they're on a timer. Maybe a neighbor was entrusted with a key to keep an eye on the house since they had left. You know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. So finally, I, I, um, I went across the street. I introduced myself to the neighbors and I said, do you know if anybody in the neighborhood's been entrusted with a key? And they said that they didn't know of anyone. And I said, okay, well, I went over today and all of the lights were turned on inside of the house. Did maybe a realtor come to the house to show it, not realizing that it had sold? You know, somebody must have come in and turned the lights on. And again, they hadn't seen anybody. So I figured, oh, well, you know, I'll figure it out. Maybe it is a timer, you know, what, whatever it is. So I went ahead and I continued to um, do my work in the house. The next day that I, uh, when I was leaving that day, um, I was having trouble with that lock, getting the door to lock when I left. I went through the house before I left. I made sure everything was locked up. I made sure all of the lights were turned off. And I um, went ahead to go and leave. And when I came back the next morning, I put the key into the lock, didn't even turn it, and the door just opened. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, maybe, maybe I didn't have it pulled into the door frame all of the way, and that's why I was having trouble locking it. So I just went ahead and I went in. And I, again, went upstairs. I put my purse down. This particular day, since all of the carpeting had been pulled up, I was going to paint the ceilings with a fresh coat of white paint. So I go to open up the sliding glass door in the back, and it's unlocked. The little, they even had the little key dangling to the side. And I thought, well, maybe one of my kids ran back. Or maybe, may I, you know, maybe I, lo I, I didn't, don't remember locking it. So maybe I didn't. Then I go downstairs, and there are garage doors for the, the garage. And... I, those were both unlocked, but I thought again, you know, I've always had the little thing on my visor that I click to open and it opens itself. I drive the car in and it shuts. I've never had to lock anything like that. And these were manual. So I thought, well, maybe I just turned it the wrong way. And then I noticed off to the side, there was this workshop within the garage that had like a regular door that you would walk in and out of. And I had Previously, the day before, I had stacked boxes up. Now, I'm five foot nine. These boxes were at chin level and a good three feet out from that door. And I put them all up against the door. And I noticed that the chain is dangling on the side of that door. And I'm like, there is no way. I know that that was locked. There is no way. Somebody had to have come into this house, moved the boxes out of the way, unlocked that chain and pushed everything back. So back over to the neighbors I go. I asked him, I said, were there any kids in the yard playing? Was, did you see anybody here? And they, you know, all of the, everything's unlocked in the house. And the lady told me, she said, I don't mean to be a nosy neighbor, but yesterday when you were leaving, I noticed that you got halfway to your car and you went back to the front door and you were shaking it. And I had forgotten about doing that and and so the door was locked and it was in the door jam correctly and so i'm like okay well you know it, it kind of, of course it kind of creeped me out a, a little bit but i thought i said to him I said, listen here's my phone number if you notice anybody in the house i'm going to start having workers come in i'm not changing the locks yet because once the renovations are done, we're ready to move in, then I'll change them because they're going to be workers. If you notice anybody here, when I'm not here, when you don't see my car, I want you to call the police. And then I want you to call me and I'll be here in about, you know, 20 minutes or so. And they agreed to do that. And of course, you know, some other things happened, but things started to amp up when we slept the two nights so that we did. This house was so badly haunted that we were not, I never moved into it. We slept two nights there, that was, that was it. Um, the first night, 
that we spent there. I brought blow up mattresses um, for the kids to sleep on. My daughter brought a friend for a sleepover and it was on a school night too, but the parents were okay with it. So she brought her friend over and about three o'clock in the morning, the girls woke me up and the girl wanted to go home. Her, my daughter's guest wanted to go home. Now what 13 year old do you know that had a sleepover was gonna wanna go home? Mm -hmm. So um, my daughter mentioned to me that apparently she had gone, to, the friend had gone into the kitchen to get some cookies. And when she came back out, something spooked her that she didn't even bring the cookies. She left them in the kitchen and, and came out into the hallway and got my, my daughter. And then she wouldn't even go in the bathroom without my daughter coming along with her. So something really, really spooked her. And um, I ended up having to, you know, call her parents and let her talk to her parents. And they convinced her to stay with us. And um, so she did. She ended up staying until morning. She didn't sleep at all, but she stayed until morning. I dropped him off the next day at school. Um, the, next, the next time we slept over, a couple of days passed, and the kids are again are like, when are we going to sleep over? When are we going to sleep over? So I'm like, okay, you know, you know, we'll go ahead and do it again. This time it was just me with my children and our dog. And my dog would not go into that house. She bulked so far hard that her, her collar came over her head. She was a little schnauzer. A uh, little black schnauzer. And um, so I let her, you know, I hooked her up in the front yard to let her run around in the yard for a little while, thinking maybe she had to go to the bathroom. And then I went to get her again and she was squirming. I had to carry her inside of the house. She darted around for a while, I guess looking for an exit now that I know because my children were seeing things in the house before I did. And of course, they weren't telling me. And there was an incident in the house that occurred downstairs with my children. The dog was in the room and she almost dug a hole in the drywall next to the door to get out when that happened. When she came up with me, I didn't know that that had happened. She's trembling in the doorway and I thought she was cold. So I wrapped her up in a towel and she wouldn't take her eyes off of me, um, you know, the rest of the evening. My son took a bath that night. He put on his pajamas. He had a little short sleeve shirt and some Bob the Builder or whoever, Teletubbies or something, whatever it was at the time that it was his favorite. And they, um, they, you know, went and laid down in bed. And I, you know, I was looking around the house and I'm like, everything is half started. I, I want to finish something and have it done. So the master bedroom bathroom was small and I decided I could paint the ceiling and the walls and be done with it in a couple of hours. So I did. Around 11 o'clock, I go to the kitchen to clean up my paint brushes. And as I'm leaving the, the kitchen, on the right hand, on the right hand side, there's a wrought iron railing that that prevents you from falling into the um, descending stairs off of the foyer. And it was also where the young man had hung himself from. And as I'm standing there, I see this horrific thing coming up from the lower level, goes across the double entry doors and up these stairs in front of me and shoots down the hallway towards the master bedroom. And I, I was frozen. I'm like, what on earth is that? And I mean, it was, it was on, it was, it was, it had a narrowing to its face, had large openings on its nose, like, like, like a horse, a horse nose, like Nary's. It almost took the whole end of its face. It had ears on it, like a rabbit but they were on each side of its head, like what we call here the FTD man, where they're turned, and they were turned backwards and grazing over this thing's shoulders. And it was up on its haunches. It has like a large squirrel bushy tail, but it was up on its haunches. I am five foot nine. When it came to the top of the stairs, it was a little bit shorter than me, maybe like five, six or five, seven. And then it shot down the hallway. And again, I'm trying to rationalize. I'm like, that is the most, horrific thing I've ever seen. It was brown, dull colored. The, the skin was kind of, you know, sunken and over bone looking. And I'm like, again, rationalizing it. I've been painting, there were fumes, maybe my blood sugar's low, maybe a, maybe a motorcycle or a bicycle went underneath a streetlight because I didn't have all of the dressings on the windows yet. So to make that kind of a reflection you know, but yet it would be impossible for it to do that. So all of a sudden I hear my dog growling um, at the end of the hallway, which kind of brought me back to reality. And I 
immediately go down there to see what she's ferociously growling at. And she is standing fixated on that bedroom door. And when I went through the bedroom door past her, she didn't even know. I mean, she, she acknowledged me for a second, put her ears back for a second, and then they were back up alert. Her hair was up on her back and she was just ferociously standing there protecting her space. So um, I'm like, okay, you know, I, I couldn't understand why she was doing that. I picked her up, took her out to the bathroom and I'm kind of speeding up things because there's so much to tell, mm -hmm. but I wanna make sure that we have enough time to get it into the time frame. When I brought her, I had to carry her again back into the house. She ran in, she nestled between the two kids. I cleaned up and crawled in bed with the kids too. And so all of a sudden, you know, morning comes. And I said to my daughter, I said, how did you sleep last night? And she said, I didn't. She said, I felt like something was standing in the doorway, staring at us all night long. And um, my son, when I woke him up, he had bite marks on his legs. He had bite marks on both legs and they looked like dog bite marks but they were smaller the, the the shape of the mouth was smaller than like my dog would have done so I remember asking him I said you know Austin what what happened you've got bite marks he had one on each one on each thigh area one towards the back one on the calf and then one on the other leg and he's touching them you know he's seven years old he's touching them he's like I don't know I'm like they're purple you know, you could see the teeth. And I'm like, I mean, anybody to have them made purple like that, you know, you would feel that if it happened to you. And um, so, and he's like, you know, he's touching him. He's like, I don't know. Well, of course that weirded me out. I took the kids. I left. We, I didn't go back probably for five or six days. Then I'm at work. And kind of when you step away something, you, from something, you kind of start to rationalize and, you know, you, you, you make it, like you're you're silly like oh no you know maybe he had been playing with his dinosaur and it's a delayed bruise or or something like that and I you know so I went ahead and and um I went back and I had workers that that were I had four different workers three of them never came back the fourth one was stoned all of the time so he actually carried um uh, an argon probably on his back and he was a member of their club so they didn't bother him so um and he did excellent work and as long as he didn't do it around my children i was okay with that so um with the first with the first two they had reasonable reasons for not coming back one had another job that opened up for him that was paying more the next one had a, a person in the hospital but they never he never even came back to get his dewalt tools or to get paid he left his expensive tools there, never came back and got them. So the third person was a friend of mine's cousin. And um, I got to find out with, with him what, what had happened through my friend. So um, when my friend's cousin, I called him Bobby in the book, when he was there putting in the wooden flooring in my son's room, I was outside of the room in the hallway painting the walls. And... All of a sudden I turn and I see coming up the stairs, this young man. And I mean, he had on blue jeans and an Oxford white shirt. He had brown hair kind of parted down the middle. He looked to be in his late teens, maybe kind of had like, like acne or rosacea to his face, or maybe it was just dark. And um, it, it, it appeared like that to me. And he was so real. He was as clear as I'm looking at you. And when I turned and I thought to myself, I said to him, I said, did you knock? Because I thought maybe it was some disoriented person wandering in the house or he knocked and I didn't hear him, you know, so um, Bobby thinks that I'm talking to him and he's like, oh, no, I might have bumped something. And when I then I looked directly back at the stairs, there was nothing there. And at that moment, I, I then realized that we had a ghost in the house. So I packed up my things and left that day, left Bobby there to finish putting in the flooring and I'm in the car line at school picking up my kids and I get a phone call from Bobby and he says, I have to leave. I have to leave right now. He says, there's something weird about this house that I've never experienced ever before in my life. And then the line dropped. And I tried to call him and, and connect with him. It took about an hour or a little bit longer to uh, get a hold of him. And finally I said, I said, what happened? And he said, oh, it was nothing, but I'd really rather be there when you're going to be there. 
And I said, well, I'm working this weekend. It's a Friday. I'm not going to be coming back. I work a Baylor shift on the weekend. So that's 12 hour shifts. I won't be back before Tuesday. Did you at least secure the house? You know, closing up the windows because some of the windows didn't have screens on them because there were these odd shaped air conditioners. They were the kind of doors that crank the windows that would crank and would open this way instead of the up and down thing. And so I ended up having to go back to the house to pull in an air conditioner. So I asked my next door neighbor, Ellen, I said, um, you know, I have to go back to my house. Would you like, you know, would you mind coming with me? I have an air conditioner that I have to pull and I'm going to need some help. She agreed to go. I was telling her about what I saw with the young man in the house earlier that day. And I said, do you believe in ghosts? And she said, oh yeah, yeah, I believe in ghosts. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure that there's a ghost in this house. If you don't feel comfortable you don't want to go in with me, I totally understand. I'm grateful that you're going with me to, to the place. I can get the lady's husband across the street maybe to come in with me and and take the air conditioning in. And she says, oh, no, no, I'm fine. She says, I'll, I'll go in with you. So we arrived, and now this time I'm having trouble with the key. I almost broke the key off trying to get it out of the, the lock. It was so stuck in there. And But I had the door open. So Ellen walked in. She's standing in the foyer, and she makes a joke. And she says, you're not going to leave me here and let the boogeyman get me, are you? And I'm like, you know, I, I ignored her comment and we went ahead, we went in, she helped me pull in the air conditioner. And I was telling her, you know, it was her first time there. I was proud. I kind of wanted to show her around a little bit too. So I had made mention that my daughter wanted to have a wild horse theme in her bedroom. So I had gotten these beautiful uh, wooden um, carved Morgan horse heads to drape a valance over her bed. Um, to, to hold the balance. And um, I was showing them to Ellen, we were in the kitchen and she's holding one in each hand. And all of a sudden I hear this sound um, coming up behind us. It was a kind of like a didgeridoo sound like that, wah, wah, but it was static also. And there was kind of like this, this, this foggy wall kind of forming. And I, I didn't say anything about it because I thought I was the only one seeing it and hearing it. And all of a sudden, Ellen says to me, she says, what's that noise? I said, well, you remember I told you that there was a ghost in the house. I said, we'll just finish up. We're going to go ahead. Let's just go ahead and go. So she still had the horse heads in her hand and she starts screaming. She says, oh, my. And she drops the horse hands down on the kitchen counter. And she's, what is it? What is it? A spider bite? She's pulling her shirt around. She says, it's burning. You know, it's burning me really, really bad. And I lifted up the back of her shirt and there was a four inch claw mark diagonal between her shoulder blades. And it was just welting and beating blood. And, and being a nurse, um, you know that that welting response is one of the first responses. It looked like a cat scratch, one single cat scratch, and it was beating blood. And um, even if you pick off a scab, you don't get that welting thing to happen again. So it was a fresh scratch. And I'm like, Ellen, you know, what? What did you do? Did you maybe, you know, again, there's still no furniture in the house. Did you maybe scratch yourself on the car door getting out? You know, you've got a, a scratch mark on your back and it was diagonal. And it was partially underneath her bra strap. And she starts screaming again that it got her again. And then she ended up with a claw mark on her stomach um, below her belly button as well. And we ended up getting out of there. I told her to leave. I started praying out loud. I was calling in every source that I could think of, Jesus, God, Mother Mary, Archangel Michael, I was calling on anybody that would listen, Buddha, come on, you know, somebody come in that the wall thing started to move back, but it didn't completely go away. It, it, it cleared the room, but that that fog was like a portal type thing. Um, so we ended up, we ended up leaving and when my friend Ellen ended up getting clawed, I couldn't deny anymore. So when I got home for the first time, I get on the computer and I start looking for churches. I start looking for paranormal groups, somebody to help me, you know, with the issue in the house. And um, I made this list of churches to call the next day because it was later on in the evening. 
and was looking at these sites. And so the next day I get up early, I take my kids to school and I'm sitting there, I'm calling these churches one by one. I think I called every single one of them in the yellow pages. And I was told to get the Catholics. Or I was told that if I was attending their church, I wouldn't be having this problem. And because I was a single mother, I was even accused by two of them actually, that because I was a single mother, because I made mention that I was a single mother with, with children, you know, I needed help. Um, they basically insinuated that I must be being promiscuous and drawing that kind of energy to me because I'm being promiscuous, which of course wasn't true either. I mean, I hadn't even been out on a date in four years. I was focusing on my kids. So finally, I got a hold of a paranormal group in a state here in, in, in uh, the United States in Georgia. And I had the paranormal group come to the house along with the Presbyterian minister that I knew from, from church. And uh, they came in and they did a, um, the, um, the Episcopalian preach, pre, uh, priest sorry, came in the night before because he wanted to know what he was up against, whether it was just maybe a, a ghost, you know, some lost soul that could easily be crossed over. But it was demons. There were two of them. So <clears throat> he actually got pictures of them, um, which are also in my book. But uh, so the next day we came back, he set up in the living room to do the do the ritual that needed to be done in order to bless the house. And during that, I was attacked. I felt this this lash on my forearm that was hot and it felt like it, it cut me to the bone. And I remember holding my hand over the spot. And I was afraid that if I moved my hand from the spot that blood would start coming out everywhere. And he came and he put the cross over my hand. He could see that I was in pain and the pain immediately stopped. So um, he went through the whole ritual. He blessed the corners of the yard. He, bled, he went and crawled up in the attic. He went down in that lower level. I mean, he, he was there 10 hours, I would say. He was there a good part of the day doing this very, very thorough blessing, told me that it was okay then for me to go back into the house. So I'm like, great. So I started to make arrangements to have my furniture moved in and have the flooring finished and the lawn needed to be mowed. So I went over with my kids. This time my son has a friend named Zachary that comes along with him. They're playing outside, sword fighting with sticks and, you know, playing in a tree. And um, I'm downstairs in the garage, I'm putting gasoline, or you all call it petrol in the, in the gasoline, in the um, lawnmower to uh, bow the grass. And Zachary, my son's friend, comes down the stairs and he's holding his neck and he's wincing. And I'm like, what happened? You know, did, uh, did Austin whack you with a stick or, you know, did you get scratched on the, what happened? And he's like, I don't know. I got to the bottom of the stairs and it just hit me. And he says, and it was burning too. And I lifted up his hand and of course there was nothing there. And then he started to retch. And the nausea, the overwhelming nausea that they can create when you're in a house, they attacked my mother a couple of times while we were in there and that sort of thing happened. But I knew what it was. So I immediately got into the car, called my kids. I said, it's time to go. I told my son and my daughter, I said, do not come through do not come down to the lower level, go out the front door and meet me at the car. But my daughter didn't hear me say that. So she ends up coming down the stairs to see what I'm calling her for. She gets to the bottom stair and she starts, she's like, ah, and she starts holding her ankle. And I'm like, what happened? What's the matter? She says, I don't know. I didn't twist my ankle coming down. I didn't do anything you know, that would cause this burning sensation in my, my ankle. And she was almost on all fours crawling through that garage. I had to help her to the car. And so I loaded up the kids. We left, got down, you know, away from the house. And um, the pain started to subside. But I got home and I called up the priest and I said, those things are still there. They attacked my kid and my, my, my son's friend today, my daughter and my son's friend today. I said, so I'm going to sell the house. I, I'm not, I, you know, it's one thing to have to deal with criminals in, at large, but it's another thing to have to deal with something in your house that you cannot see. I said, so I'm, I'm not, I'm going to sell the house. I, I can't, I can't live there. And really 
I would have loved to have burnt that house to the ground and just left it. But I couldn't afford as a single mother and not even people that are married couldn't afford to pay for a place for these things to live in Why you have to pay for a second place for yourself and your family to live in. So he's like, no, 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 no. You know, you don't sell it. You command them out in the name of Jesus Christ and they, they need to leave. He said, you know, you have to make them leave. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm envisioning having my family over and friends over for a nice dinner, holiday dinner. And I see one of those things walk through the room and I stand up and I start screaming at it to command it out of my house in the name of Jesus Christ. How long my guests are going to stay after that happens and how many of them are going to invite me to their house because I might be bringing more than chocolate cake when I come. So I'm like, no, I'm not interested in doing that. I can't put my children through this. It's one thing, you know, uh, I, you know, you, what, you know, when your children come to you in the middle of the night and they, oh, there's something in my closet or there's something under my bed. I said, in this house, there might really be something. And not only that, it might even be in their bed and they can't come to me for safety while we're all huddling, while the sheets are getting pulled off. I said, no, thank you. I said, I'm out. I said, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, keep this house. So, and a lot of other things happen too. If you're into that kind of thing, the book is called Omnipresent. It's my first book. It has a white door with creepy hands on it, which is an actual event that happened in the house while my son was sitting on the master bathroom loo. I think that's when he went to the toilet. Um, and he saw that coming in at him. To this day, he is 23 years old. He was left with such post-traumatic stress from the two nights that we stayed in that house and seeing what he saw when he was in the bathroom that to this day, he will not sleep without a light on. He refuses to sleep in the dark. It scared him that bad. So anyway, um, I go ahead. I have this fourth guy come. Um, he's finishing the renovations. The third guy, who was my friend's cousin, um, that didn't come back either. I saw my friend at work and I said, hey, you know, uh, will you ask Bobby what happened in the house? Because he never came back. And I think it might be something to do with paranormal. And she says, oh, okay. You know, so July comes. So I've owned this house for eight months, getting the renovations done. We've only slept in there twice. And um, so she asks him, he comes to her house, he has a, a beer or two, and he's feeling a little bit talkative. And she asks him, she said, well, what happened? You know, why didn't you go back to Lynn's house? And he said, oh, he says, she's the nicest lady. And I feel bad that I didn't finish the job. But that house is words that I can't say on your program. And it starts with an F. Um, and it's up. So um, anyway, he started to tell her what had happened. And he said that he was in my son's room. And he was on this, uh, this um, gardening bench with wheels. So he could kind of scoot sideways like a crab and put the wooden flooring in. And he had a mallet and a trowel and he had um, 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 a block of wood to kind of tap it in because it was tongue and groove flooring. So um, he said that he had put a piece of flooring in that he went to reach for the tools and they were gone. So he thought that he had rolled over them. So he kind of moves to check to see if he's sitting on top of them. And, they, and he wasn't. And he said that he glanced over at the door, which was not that far from him. And he said that they were lined up paralleling each other, all three of them, right in front of that door. And he said it freaked him out. He's like, OK, you know, I didn't put him there. Then he thought that I had come and snuck in behind him and moved the tools. And I was playing a joke. So he got up and he was calling out in the hallway, looking to see if I was there. And of course I was not. So he turns on the light in the bedroom. He has a battery operated radio and he sits back down. He moves the tools back and the light turns itself off and the radio then turns itself off and he can hear the tools moving behind him. And they lined back up in front of that door exactly like they were. And he said that he couldn't get out of there fast enough. The thing about my book is that I put a self-help section in the back because the one thing is, is when you're in this devastating circumstance, there aren't many places that you can call that won't haul you away to the mental facility. So, you know, um, so I did put a self-help section in the back in the first one of how to photograph to determine before you move into a place, 
to take your camera with you, how to take pictures to determine whether there are souls in the house or not. Because even if you have a harmless soul in your house, they have a, a, a negative pull that kind of drains your energy. It can make you tired. It can make you not sleep well. So it's really not a good idea, even when it's a friendly ghost, not to keep them in your house. Now, that doesn't mean that our loved ones that cross come back and forth Yes, you know, by all means, but the meeting with them is never negative feeling. It's usually something very beautiful. They come into our dreams. They're not the, 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 the beings that are standing next to your bed, shaking your bed in the middle of the night. And that's another thing, too, I want to bring up for people that are parents. If your children have come to you more than once and talked about the same thing, like a soul visiting them during the night or somebody that they're seeing in the house, Please don't tell them that there's nothing there because certain ages, they don't have the filters yet and they're able to see into the veils through the veils of the interdimensions. And that's why a lot of times children have like an invisible friend. That friend is very real. That friend is a spirit. It's not, it's invisible to you, but it's not invisible to them. And it is actually there. Um, also telling them, oh, well, it's your Aunt Lulu and she's your guardian angel. Well, if it was their Aunt Lulu, it wouldn't be shaking their bed, pulling their covers off and scaring the daylights out of them while they're trying to sleep. A visit from a guardian angel, a visit from a loved one that has crossed over is always very warm and welcome and never frightening. So the thing is, is to empower your children. Since we are living amongst human embodied people and there are other types of souls that are that are wandering the earth as well to empower your children and teach them you know ask say is this being frightening you are they telling you to do something that you know that you're not supposed to do and a child will of course speak up on that and if either of those two things or both of those things are answered with a yes tell them to tell it to leave that they they have no power there and to tell it to leave they can have a little prayer that they can recite out loud, a little song that's that's the, of a religious, you know, affiliation that to move to move the things away and tell it not to come back. So to give them some tools to empower themselves with it, you know, if you tell them that there's nothing there, they can see the guy standing next to you. So it's a little bit confusing, you know, for them for something like that. But anyway, um. Um, since we're getting to the end, and I want to kind of start finish on a, a, a happier note. Um, I ended up finding a couple that was retired because I, after having people come to see it with children who also saw the creep, they didn't want to be in the creepy room as it was discussed between two of the children. I knew as a mother I couldn't sell it to a family with children. So a retired couple came up, it was a cash buy, and we were signing papers at the house. And as we were leaving, I overhear the wife saying to the husband, why did you push me? And he said, I, I didn't push you. He's like, you're three steps in front of me. I can't even reach you. And she says, well, I don't know what happened then, but I knew what happened. I knew about the one demon that kind of controlled the, the stairwell and the locks and all of the things like that that were being played with. So when they came out, my conscience got the best of me. I couldn't do to them what I had had done to me. And I said to them, I said, um, do, you, do you believe in ghosts? And both of them, they cut me off. And they said, no, nope, we're Baptists. We don't believe in those sorts of things. We don't discuss those sorts of things. And we are protected. And I'm like, okay. You know, if they had asked me, I would have elaborated. I would have told them the truth. Even if I had lost the sale of the house, I couldn't bring myself since they were being affected by them. I had hoped that somebody that wasn't as sensitive as me could have moved in there. I hoped that all of the many, many denominations of religion that I had in the house um, would have finally taken some effect, maybe even a delayed reaction. Um, I had an Indian woman there that told me some things about the house, which is where I learned that it's not about the house's age, it's about the ground that it's built on, that a lot of things that occur that are negative inside of a house occur because of where the house is built and the, pres the demonic presences or negative influences are already there that exacerbate the situation causing the heinous acts to occur in that area. So um, anyway, um, I'll kind of stop there. Very, very dark, creepy story. 
I'm trying to think of um, something light that I can uh, finish off on here. Um, the Colors of Heaven also has areas that talk about the things that I've, I've asked my mother, like about um, the food thing. They talk about the need for people to, um, uh, what is the wording, that they, that they can raise their vibration while they're here on earth. They talk about the importance of doing that. Um, they also talk about um, uh, that they have a... Can I interrupt? So I just want to yes. say to the audience, this is your new book that's coming out. Um, yes, I'm sorry. That's fine. So and who's they, who's they you're referring to? My, my mother. My mother, my father, my brother, and my sister are all on the other side. My family was riveted with cancer. So my mother passed away first. My, uh, my father then passed away, my brother passed away, and actually my sister passed away first, and then my mother, my father, my brother. So sometimes I'm in communication with okay. them, um, especially with helping with writing this book, some of the things that I've, that I've wanted to ask about, and some things that they wanted to kind of key in on, like the importance of everyone loving each other. You know, even, even looking in traffic and you're frustrated because this elderly person's in front of you and they're holding everybody up. You have no idea that that could very well be a guardian angel place there to protect you from what could happen 10 miles down the road. So instead of screaming obscenities or getting angry with this person and laying on your horn, rattling them even more, send the light of love and surround them with it and say thank you. Because you just don't know what they've prevented you from having down the road. Um, it taught, you know, it's just there, there are so many things that are important with the other side, as far as even balancing emotions, people, they get into their feelings and emotions, and sometimes they can get very, very negative. And, and it's just important to hone those in and rein those in um, so that you can actually have a connection with the other dimensions that can actually guide you um, through life so that you have all of the things that you, that you want that you don't have now. You know, it, 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 you can get these things, and it's not about monetary things. It's just that they can make sure that you have everything that you need. So it's just that's important as well, too. So, yeah. Um, can I just ask you two questions, probably in relation to your upcoming book? Um, in regards to angels, does everyone have a guardian angel? Well, you have a whole bunch of angels. Okay. Um, and you can say, sometimes they kind of change places. There's not one designated one. There's usually a group of them that will come out a lot of times. And a lot of times it's not even someone that you know from this lifetime. It can be someone that you know from before you came here. So sometimes, depending on what it is that you are being guided with, if that makes sense, they send in um, different souls to, to help, help you with that because it's also something that they're kind of learning on the other side, if it's, say, for instance, a family member that crossed over versus an angel, you know, something that they maybe needed to also have some schooling with in this lifetime that they can help you work through it that also gives them the benefit of learning some new things as well. So it depends. It depends on what you're needing to be um, guided with. But yes, they are always there. They are always waiting to be called on. They don't impose themselves. They, they stand back and, and let you do as much as you can do yourself. But when you do need help, don't wait until everything's been messed up so bad that finally, you know, it's at a, at a, a, a peak point and now all of a sudden it's a big mess and you're, you know, yelling for God to come and help you. Speak with them every day and ask them to help guide your day and to come in and help pave the path and make things smoother or, you know, to help guide you in, in, in the way that you speak or the way that, you know, people hear you um, so that your day, you know, can be smoother and it never gets to that high peak of, of anxiety or, or, you know, negativity that way that, that takes a while to undo it. So. And, and your also advice is just to have a conversation like with a friend or you're just talking to someone, you can call them. You are talking. They can hear you. They can be in six places equally at one time. My father, oh, that's a, something nice we can close with. My father had a near-death experience. My father was not a religious man. And he went to his doctor to have a physical and they found bulging veins in his eye. Now this is colors of heaven, beginnings never end. The dark one was omnipresent. There's one in the middle that kind of uh, tail ends on that one. But this is the colors of heaven. 
he, because he had this bul these bulging veins in his eye, they sent him over to the hospital right away. They found that there was a rapidly moving clot that was, they, they didn't have time to dissolve it. He would have been gone within 24 hours. So they put him in the hospital and did surgery and surgically removed the clot. And when he was in the recovery room, he woke up and the nurse was just putting in a morphine injection into his IV and something just came over him and said, no, don't, don't, you know, don't do that. So he said to the nurse, no, 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 you know, I don't want that. But she had already put half of it in and she's like, what, you don't want your pain medicine? And he's like, no. And he said that everything turned black. He felt himself floating. He went up to the ceiling of the recovery room, heard them calling the code blue. He saw the crash carts coming in. He saw the doctors and nurses working on him. He said that he rolled over at one point and was watching and then he continues to float. Now with somebody that's going through a near death experience, they don't have, they, they're not always introduced to the loved ones you're, you're, because you're gonna be sent back. So oftentimes you're in the tunnel Sometimes you are in a field with one person um, or, or that sort of thing. And in this case, he was in the tunnel and he was talking about how warm it was, how it was dark, but it was like glistening gold stars. He sensed that there were other souls floating around him, also kind of transitioning up. Um, he did get to see my deceased sister. That was one that he was allowed to see. But they don't then enter you into the rest. And he was stopped by by a soul, he said that it was Jesus. And um, he, he, they, they gave him a choice to return or stay. And he was then at that point in time able to see six places simultaneously. So he was, he had six children. He was with all five of his remaining children and his new wife from Russia that had just barely come to the United States. And, he's, and he knew that all of his children were gonna be okay. And the thing about that is, <coughs> excuse me, is he actually told me what I had on that day when he was standing next to me and I was in a different state. I had this favorite shirt. It was white with pastel stripes of different colors on it. And it was, I wore it all the time. I loved it. It was soft, you know? So he told me, he described the shirt, short sleeve white with pretty, you know, ribbons of pastel colors. And he was correct. But when he looked at his wife that he had just brought over from Russia to the United States, she didn't even drive a car. I mean, she had, I mean, she, she would have been lost. You know, she had no one, no family here. She was, you know, her English was still getting better. Um, she, like I said, she couldn't drive a car. She didn't know where anything was. So he agreed to come back. And when he came back, and he also talked about a scent in the tunnel. He said that there was a scent that he recognized that was um, something, I don't remember what fragrance he said that it was, but it was something that, that, was, that he enjoyed. So um, he ended up coming back into his body. He said that when he came in very quickly, that when he ended up into his body, he could then feel the weight of his body and he could feel the pain from the operation. And he remembers opening his eyes and they're like, okay, you know, wow, you're back. So um, he ended up living 10 years longer, taught her how to drive, paid off the house, you know, made sure that everything was in order for her um, when he did finally cross over. So, you know, um, that it, it just, yeah. That, that was a, a nice story that he was able to share with me. So I was glad to tell it. Well, thank you, Lynn. I've just got one more question, if you don't mind. From all your <laughs> conversations with the other side, the afterlife, how can we live our best life? By loving other people. That's the main, the key thing is, is love. Um, the, that's all that they talk about. You know, coming to terms with any, any, grievances that you have letting go of the negative feelings that doesn't mean to be a doormat for somebody i mean you can choose to you know kind of you know stay out of someone's way if they're they're a problem but to to love each other you know it, it that's the main thing they say that the, the love is key so that's the main thing um yeah and of course call on them they're waiting they like to help so i mean they can even help you and I kid you not, they can even help you. Like if you've misplaced something, you know, your car keys, 
oh, you know, if you're at a calm state, help me find my car keys. You can leave a room and then come back. And they might be laying on the bed or, or they might lead you to a place and you're wondering, why am I opening the refrigerator? Well, because you stuck them in there and then you find them. So, you know, they can guide you to these places. They, they can help very actively and they, they like to. So it gives them, they have a lot of things that they do over there too. So that's nice. Beautiful answer. And I, I mean, I agree. Everything's about love and just what you mentioned in a calm state, a calm vibration. It's a much, it, it's much easier to connect with the other side in, in, in calmness. Um, Lynn Monet, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. My gosh, it, it's been such an incredible interview. Thank you so much for having me. I just appreciate so much you having me here for allowing me to come. My pleasure. Thanks for being such a great guest. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.